evening, everybody. I'm Beth Jones. I'm one of the guidance counselors. Uh, good evening. I'm Kate Simmons, one of the other counselors. Um, just wanted to make a couple of points. Um, we have a PowerPoint presentation, a general overview of the uh, college process, you know, it's focused on juniors. Um, it can be found on the guidance web page under resources. So if you do want to print it out and have a look at it, there's a lot of information on it. There's a lot of hyperlinks that you can get to other things, but you know, we didn't print out a million of them, but they're certainly on, um, on our website. Okay, so thank you all for coming. All right, so we appreciate everybody taking the time out of their, their busy evening schedules to come partner with us um, to go for a general overview about post high school planning and in more specifics, college planning what we do to support your students, as well as what you can do at home to support your students. So to start us off, we're gonna um, play a short video and then we'll get started. So our agenda for this evening is we're going to go through a our junior and I'll tell you a little bit about our senior group guidance overview. Um, some of the testing, the standardized testing that's available for your students to take as part of the entrance criteria for most colleges. We'll review how to research colleges and um, some of the supports that are available to you. And then we'll give a general overview of the college application process and financial aid. And uh, we also will re-review this with you in the fall as there are two separate parent meetings, um, one right in the beginning of the year for the um, college application, how to apply presentation, and then we have a financial aid um, presenter come in from higher ed as well as some financial aid um, boot camps available. Uh, we'll then go through the college process timetable, and then we have time for some questions and answers. So junior group guidance. Um, our group guidance <clears throat> is something unique to Brewster. Not many schools have the opportunity that we do to meet in small groups of about, at most, 12 students um, a day, all of us counselor with our own caseload. And so we've been doing this with students for the past three years, um, where they've, we've established a Google Classroom with them, that if they've invited you, you might get some push notifications from us. 
where we go through a sequence of different topics with your students. So for example, this school year, the junior program, our first session was PSAT registration with a transcript review. So, so at, since this year was different, everybody took the PSAT, there wasn't much um, kind of registration overview, but we focused on the transcript review and what colleges look for in an applicant. Our second session, um, which was more recent, since our scores came back a little late, um, was to review the PSAT scores. So some of you guys, some of you did that at home. Um, the rest of our students hopped on to College Board, created an account, and then we talked about the different strategies of SAT prep um, and options for that. Our next session um, should be in about a month or so where we're gonna go through when, when we've done the game plan. So the game plan is actually a survey your son or daughter or any student here that hasn't filled it out uh, should really take the time to do so. That helps us as counselors prepare for our one-to-one -one meeting with you and your family. So it's uh, more or less going to advise us of some of the things that are important in the criteria, some of what they're interested in, whether it be majors or types of schools, and it just allows us to individualize the process to make uh, efficient use of all of our time when we come to meet. <clears throat> we then will also do some different searches. So Naviance is a is a platform that we use to assist with all the data that we have for about, I think, 13 to 15 years here at Brewster High School. We track um, different uh, criteria that schools want, different um, trends that our students have set, so who got into what school, what SAT score they had, GPA. So it's a very visual platform, and then when students are applying in the fall, we spend a you know, that's where they're telling us and linking the system so that we can send um, almost all of our applications electronically. So it's an important platform to get used to. Um, there may be some visuals in, in this program a little bit later, um, but I can't stress that using Naviance is super helpful as it is a tool that we must use in the fall to help us track and be most efficient with the application process. Uh, there's also a bunch of other college searches that will show the students and resources on the website that we can point them to that might have other features that Naviance lacks. Our fourth session around March will do course selection. So again, as a junior, this is very important. Um, we'll review um, you know, what the criteria is for graduation, which we have been doing for years, so everybody's sort of on track with our, with our guidance. And then <clears throat> from there, we'll go through what the options are. So teachers will begin to talk to your students about recommendations they may have or options they may have in different classes and what that criteria is. Um, and then we will go over the electives and then students go on to pick their important classes for senior year. Um, and the last session we do before we all break for summer is we will have them hop on Common App, which is one of the most popular platforms for applying to college, as it sort of is a one-stop shop for most colleges where you're filling out the bulk of your information, you're able to apply to many different colleges through this platform. Uh, we'll go through a summer to-do list of things that we think might be helpful for you or for your student to get a leg up uh, as far as coming back in the fall, be prepared to uh, begin the application process, and then we also have them continue um, to work on their Raise Me account, which is an account that establishes micro scholarships based on a number of criteria from good attendance to visiting schools, A's, B's, joining a club and activity. So it's been a good platform for students to earn some money uh, towards their college education. I just want to make one point about the group guidance. It's a wonderful opportunity to have to meet with students, but it's only as good as however we have, you know, how many students come. So we email students, we email you if you've got about any change in email addresses or you haven't gotten anything, um, you know, maybe you should give guidance at all. We do them for four or five days, and then we use the fifth day as a makeup day. So I, I, we say this over and over again, but we have a lot of, a lot of material to cover and a lot of students to cover know with it so if you can't come on you know, the first period when it's my group guidance come to anyone that you can just don't
don't miss the information. Have a Google Classroom for guidance. The information is all there. So, um, you know, the more that's utilized, the more everybody's hearing the same thing over and over again. And I have to echo the same thing in the last bare facts, which is our little newspaper here at Brewster High School. One of our students, or some students that were expressing stress over the college process, and another student wrote a nice article about the fact that if you just kind of plug in and stay the course with group guidance and attend the sessions, that you won't feel overwhelmed. Because we sort of keep you on um, a nice pace track along with, you know, kind of coordinating it with parent presentations so that we're all on the same page. We sort of give you the step-by-step. -step, um, and, and just because we don't go into depth in this presentation next year, in the fall is really critical. All students must attend um, the group guidance sessions. And as Mrs. Jones said, they never are programmed at the same um, same period for a full year, so you only miss one class. But students have the flexibility, as Mrs. Jones said, saying, oh, Mrs. Simmons, I can't make it. You know, third period, I may be calc. I'm going to go when I have three. I'm going to go when I have lunch or PE. Or they, they can choose that and be proactive rather than just sort of skip it in general. Um, because again, this is where we're feeding them a um, little bit of information at a time so that the process isn't overwhelming and then offering a ton of support. So for example, by Thanksgiving this year, we had already had four group guidance sessions, um, at least three application drop-ins, so days where students can just come in, work on their application with the support of counselors around for a full day. So if they have multiple freeze or study halls, they were able to drop in and just sort of hammer out some of the application itself, ask questions about the process. And um, we also held a boot camp prior to school um, where there was a general overview of the college process for students that knew they wanted to apply early and get a jump start and um, a lot of delivery, again, of information. So it's we start basically the first week of school with your students. And again, if they're not attending, um, you know, they're missing out on some important information that will help keep us all um, in, in the low stress zone for the fall. So some of the other services this year is in, in February through April, we do individual um, college planning or post high school planning. So if your son or daughter does not know explicitly, it doesn't have to be explicitly college focused. It might be trade school, it might be going into the workforce, it might be um, you know military, but <clears throat> these meetings are set up individually um, throughout the school day. So there will be a letter that's going to go out and go home and give you the steps of how to, how to make that appointment. Um, you're going to call guidance and, and speak to one of our secretaries and they're going to find a mutually convenient time with your student schedule, our schedule, and then um, as flexible as you can be. So again, you're just going to call the guidance secretaries, that's the most efficient way. Um, if there's anything special, like especially if your student plans to participate in D1 or D2 sport, um, we want to know ahead of time. So if there is a uh, coach or, or the athletic director, whoever's most appropriate that can attend our meeting, that's super helpful. And if you do have questions <clears throat> that you absolutely are itching to know in that meeting, the more information we have ahead of time, like I mentioned before, the more efficient, effective, and individual we can be in that meeting. So if there's something that you heard or something you read or something you want us to review, please feel free after you've set up the appointment to email us a question or two or give us a call if there's something specific you want to cover or have your student uh, email or mention it in their game plan survey. So throughout the spring, colleges will be coming back to do different visits um, where they do an overview, they get to know our students um, the spring, then they come back in the fall. So students do have the opportunity to learn about colleges. We post all this information on our guidance calendar. Um, we also send them emails through Naviance about who's coming in, as well as make announcements in, in the morning announcements about who's coming, what colleges are coming to visit. So some will be coming this spring, and then in the, all throughout the fall, different colleges will be dropping in. And in May, May 1st, there's a college night for parents and students at Fox Lane High School from 6 to 9. 
So this program is super helpful as it's almost set up like a college fair. So if you haven't been exposed to that many schools, it's a good place to go grab information, talk to admissions counselors, and start to you know get your get your feet wet. So standardized testing. Um, I know that little video went by very shortly, but there's a few different components that colleges are looking at. You know, the first thing they're looking at is students transcript and what type of courses they take, how strong their GPA is. They are looking at the extracurricular involvement. Uh, they're looking at the letters of recommendation, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, and they are, some are focusing still on the standardized test. So that could be the ACT or the SAT. If your student is not a strong test taker, we've reviewed that there are schools that are that are going test optional, and there's a whole website um, dedicated to letting you know what schools are are test optional, and you just have to be careful that your major within that school is test optional. So that means that if you don't send your score and they're not as strong, and you feel like they might hold you back from entrance, and the school is test optional. You can go that route if you don't provide the SAT or ACT scores. So there are options, whereas you know 20 years ago that wasn't the case. Um, now it's a pretty good case to, to say that they're not just basing it on scores. Most of our state schools and competitive schools absolutely will use that as a determining factor, but just know that there's options if you're not a strong test taker. So the SAT um, are, is scored on two sections from 200 to 800 points you can earn up to the highest of 1600 it's got evidence-based reading and writing writing tests and a math test um, the registration as mrs jones mentioned this powerpoint has live links so if you click that red registration deadlines and test date, uh, test dates they're um, included in an information packet we'll give you when you come into school or if your students drop in uh, but the tests that are offered at BHS are in January, March, May, and June. So now is the time to start thinking about when will my students sit down and take this exam. Registering it so that they're taking it in the home school. It's not the end all be all if, if it has to be taken at a different school, if this is, there's, um, you know, all seats are filled, but if you could get a head start, it feels good to be in your home school to sit and take such a high stakes test. There are something called SAT Subject 2 tests, and some of the more <clears throat> competitive schools require up to three. So if you know you're applying to an Ivy League or a very competitive college and you see on there SAT 2 subject scores um, required, you know, this is some information we have in the guidance office. There's packets of information about what tests are offered. Um, when, again, the schedule is online and, and we have booklets for it, but it's something that if you think you may apply, you want to think about then sitting and taking these tests in, I believe, May or June. So it's something that at the meeting you can certainly ask us or if your student, that rings a bell for them that they're looking at competitive colleges, have them see us. The other standardized test is the ACT. It scores on four sections. There's a math, a science, an English, and a reading section, ranging from scores one to 36. It gives you a composite score that is an average of the four sections. We always recommend that if you're gonna take the ACT, you take it with the writing. Although the writing is optional, we recommend to take it with the, the, the writing. The deadlines um, and, and registration test dates are on this hyperlink. Uh, we offer it at Worcester High School in April and June. So again, that's not the only dates they offer it. That's when, when you would know you could sit and take it here. Um, there's another link to a sample score report for detailed information from the ACT. Um, and in our last group guidance session, we did review that there are some tools if students are unfamiliar with this test or don't know should they take both, should they take one. Um, there's some free resources for them through our Castle Learning website called Method Test Prep where there's full length free tests that the students can take to see if they are comfortable with one test over the other. Um, so along with that standardized <clears throat> testing, test prep resources, um, there's a specific handout on our website 
we've linked the students, we've had the students in the last group guidance link their PSAT scores with the Khan Academy, which offers free individualized test taking strategies to improve the weaker scores. Um, there's also the method test prep, so that's a free resource that the district funds, and we have found really great success with students that utilize that resource. So again, there's free um, full-length tests on their practice, and then there's a prescribed uh, program that students can sign up for and, and work on, on their SAT or ACT prep on that method test prep site. Fairtest.org is the website I was referring to earlier that lists the schools that do not require standardized tests as part of the admissions decision. So if that is something, once you get these scores back, um, it's good to know there's over probably 500 schools now that are part of that document. So you can easily look and identify schools that, if that's the case with your student, that you can look, look for. Um, so to register for these exams, it's, you're going to go online, create an account. All of our codes are listed up, up top um, in the presentation, along with the links. Uh, the locations and frequency of testing are as well on those websites. Um, so the codes are there for you guys to, to punch in as far as our test center codes so that you're taking it here. Any student that's classified or has a 504 and wishes to use their testing accommodations must submit a release almost six to eight weeks at the very least to Mrs. Murray, our school psychologist. So she coordinates what's something that's called students um, with disabilities, their testing accommodations that have to be applied for, approved through the College Board and ACT. So even though your student, your son or daughter might have um, extra time or some, some other test read uh, type testing accommodations, they absolutely need to apply for these accommodations, be approved, and then there's a whole prescribed way of then um, registering for these exams. In some cases they'll take it at school over one or two days depending on the type of accommodations. So there is a link that says this release in red and Mrs. Murray, the school psychologist, is the coordinator. Um, at the end of the day and next year, this last bulleted point is important that you're, it's, it's always the student's responsibility to send the standardized test scores to a college. They don't accept unofficial scores from us. So next year, you pay to take the test, you have to pay to release the scores. And there is, um, you know, some options for how to release your scores that we'll get to, um, if, to if not tonight, definitely in our, in our senior parent presentation. Um, but ultimately, you have to pay to release the scores. So I'm going to turn over to the microphone to Mrs. Jones, who's going to go through some of the college research. Okay, so college research. Um, there's you know lots of search engines out there. Um, it always worries me when a junior walks in and we say, okay, you know, go to your Naviance account, and they sort of look at you and say, hmm, Naviance, I'm not quite sure what that is. We've been using it since ninth grade, um, and the best part about it is it has rooster data in it, so you're at least comparing apples to apples. Some people like the College Board website, um, but. You know, there's thousands of colleges out there, so you have to use you know, certain criteria. Um, this can be a scary process for families, for students, and we totally understand that and, and try and address that. Um, but it is best to have the student um, driving the, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the process of looking into schools. Um, I'm a really big proponent of going to visit schools. I mean, I would say right now, February vacation is a couple weeks away. That is a wonderful time to go visit schools. They're in session. You'll see classes. You can often sit in on classes. Um, colleges, as, as Kate was mentioning, um, there's a big college fair um, uh, in May. And there'll be somewhere between two and 300 college representatives. And they're going to ask you to fill out a postcard, and they'll go home and put that in there. They'll go back to their office and put it in their data. Base. Um, they keep track of things like that. So, you know, you've spoken to the um, you know, SUNY Albany rep at the college fair. They'll be here possibly in the spring, definitely in the fall. 
um, get to know them, e get their email address, you know, create a, a conversation because then you're showing demonstrated interest, which is another piece of what schools look for. Um, just as a general idea, most of our students, and these are just rough numbers, 75% of our students go to four-year schools, 20% go to two-year schools, a community college, and um, about 5% go into the work of the military. Um, and we have information on gap years, uh, if that's something of interest as well. Everybody's got their own path. Where you start is often not where you end. Um, so, you know, we're here to kind of walk you through all the opportunities. Okay, so um, I mentioned Naviance. Um, the, the, the game plan, we met with juniors last week to go over PSAT scores, introduce the Khan Academy concept, um, and ask the students to do the game plan. So anybody that didn't do the game plan and is hoping to have an individual um, uh, college meeting, that's the very first thing we look at because it's just a very simple survey that says, do you want a big school? Do you want to be, you know, three hours from home? Do you want to be an engineer or not? Those students don't know what they want to be, and that's totally fine, but it's a good starting off point, okay? And then there's a number of different ways through Naviance you can do searches. We're going to ask you basic questions about just what I said, you know. A, a, a school with 20,000 students feels very different than a school with 5,000 students. Um, and that's where the visiting is, is so important because, you know, you might think you want this big, you know, 25,000 student rah-rah, uh, you know, big football games on Saturday afternoon, but that means you're going to be in classes, you know, uh, lecture classes with a couple hundred kids rather than a smaller environment. So, again, go into this with an open mind. Um, where you start is often very different than where you wind up. Um, so the game plan is really important. If you guys haven't done it, go to the Google Classroom and fill it out for us. Um, and then call and make an appointment. Um, if there are any password issues, they can reset, uh, we can reset their password. Uh, I can or any of the guidance secretaries. The Naviance is just, you know, it's not the only tool, but it is, it is you know, the one that's most specific to Booster. So, um, when it comes to um, sort of just your basic criteria, um, and, and this is how Naviance is set up. Location, do you want to be in a city? Do you want to be in an NYU, BU kind of environment? Or do you have an image of college where you're gonna have you know, a beautiful quad and rolling hills and um, you know, uh, very kind of contained uh, environment there? Cost is something that, you know, obviously has to be talked about. And I always encourage students to come to this meeting and certainly the senior meeting. Um, as you guys are probably well aware, the range of the cost of college is pretty unbelievable. Um, community colleges and um, uh, the CUNY system is somewhere around five, five to seven thousand dollars a year. Private colleges are now in the high sixty to seventy thousand dollar range. So that's quite a swing. Um, so now is a really good time to have an honest conversation um, with, your, with your son or daughter. Um, don't ever eliminate a school because it costs $70,000 a year because we refer to that as the sticker price. Very few people pay the full sticker price. You never know what a college um, will eventually cost your family till you apply you get accepted, to you apply, um, fill out the FAFSA form, and get a financial aid package, okay? We have a great state system um, with some wonderful scholarship programs as well. That's still about twenty-five dollars to $30,000, so again, not insignificant money. Um, majors, most students don't know what major they are, and many of the students that do um, uh, pick a major, I think the, the, the statistic is the average college student changes their major two or three times. So if you're undecided, that's fine. That's okay to apply to colleges undecided. But just be sure it's a school that has like a broad curriculum. Because it's one thing to transfer from the School of Business to the School of uh, Social Sciences or something. It's another story if, you're, if, if the school doesn't have what you want. Um, so, and again, you might think you want certain things, but the more you visit and talk to people, um, you know, there are other factors. We have a lot, of, a lot of students that apply to the same schools 
Um, so, you know, try and kind of broaden your horizons. Um, everybody's got an opinion about college, like, oh, you don't want to go there, or it's a party school, or you do want to go there because it's really rigorous. Um, so, I think an open mind is uh, really important. You're going to hear us talk about this a number of times, reach, range, and safeties or probable admits. Um, so a REACH school is a school that, you know, it's very competitive. Uh, maybe your grades are here and their criteria is here, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to get in. You have to be realistic. You have to realize that, you know, there are certain schools, the Ivy Leagues, the second tier uh, um, competitive schools, you know, they're REACHs for everybody because they're looking for very specific things. Um, a range school is a school where your GPA and your scores um, and the history we have at Naviance pretty much match up. So we feel pretty comfortable um, that you know, you'll, you'll have a good uh, possibility of getting in there. And the safety school is one where we're even more comfortable that you're going to get in. Maybe you're even overqualified for. Um, that can sometimes be the hardest school to find. Um, and then the other thing is, I always have trouble um, explaining this, but you know, a school that is sort of in your safety range um, may be much more generous in terms of financial aid because they're looking for, you know, high quality students such as yourself. So, um, you know, you're going to, the, the quality education is going to be what you put into it, but, you know, finances are obviously a factor. Um, so, it, it can, you know, private schools cost more money, but they have much more money to give. Um, so, and we'll talk more about that when we meet individuals. Um, okay, so we have a college career room. It's got every sort of Princeton review, uh, book of majors, etc. cetera. Um, as we've mentioned a couple of times, we have college reps come. Um, very embarrassing to me always, we have the schools come and the college rep comes and he sits in the college career room and nobody comes. And, and we know it's a popular school. Um, they're there to sell the school, okay? And as I said, Years ago, uh, the, I forgot to mention on the last slide, the average number of schools that most students apply to is somewhere between seven and ten, and ten schools, okay? We always have some student that applies to 25 and, you know, somebody that applies to two. So, you know, somewhere in that range is good. So the colleges are struggling to, to really um, identify Who's really interested? So, you know, you've got two applications, an admissions person has two applications in front of them. Similar scores, similar grades, similar extracurriculars, very similar profiles. You know, student A has been to the college for a visit, they've taken an information session, uh, they've met with that rep here at Brewster High School and maybe again at one of the college fairs. Student B um, hasn't done any of the above. So, you know, colleges have to evaluate this and, you know, student A is more likely to get accepted because it, the, the school is thinking that they're more likely to come. Um, we've talked about these other uh, sites for research, Naviance, College Board, um, you know, you can Google search engines and lots of them come up. Um, the college fairs we, we uh, talked about. We have in the past had some alumni come back and just talk about their college experience. We're kind of just discussing that at the moment. Um, and uh, particularly at this point in time, because I think it can be overwhelming, like where do I start? Um, so, uh, you know, I would highly recommend the college fairs because you can get a lot of information in a short amount of time, um, ask questions, and just get a sense of, you know, how, how different colleges feel. College Week Live is a, is a, uh, like a virtual college tour. Um, and uh, you can go on that website and, and uh, learn about a lot of colleges. Okay, so visiting, my students already know, I'm a, you know, a big proponent of that. The reality is most people visit over the summer because everybody's got a little bit more time uh, to do that. And that's fine, but it's, you're going to get a very different impression of the school when there's no students there. So February break, great. Uh, spring break, sometimes schools, if it falls around, you know, the Easter and Passover holiday, sometimes they will not be in session, but that's a good time to go. Um, and again, it's hard to visit every school. If you have 10 schools on your list, that's a lot of traveling around, particularly if they're spread out around the country. But, you know, 
after visiting a couple of uh, campuses, I think you begin to see what, what really is important to you and what isn't important to you. So, um, uh, you know, there's, there's a college for everybody. We all believe that. Um, but the most important thing is finding, um, you know, the right fit. So, I, as I've said many times, um, we'll often hear kids say, well, I'm going to apply to these 10 schools, and then when I get into one of them, uh, then I'll go see and decide which one I want to go to. I mean, I truly believe you're putting yourself at a disadvantage by doing that. Uh, uh, many schools will allow you to sit in on a class if you particularly, you know, are interested in certain uh, subject matter. Um, the reality is you really can't um, visit more than one or two schools in a day. And just so you know how it works is um, the colleges have an information session and they do them all week long, often on Saturdays, sometimes on Sundays, usually 10 in the morning, 2 in the afternoon. You'll go to admissions, you'll sign in, they'll give you an overview of different majors, new initiatives, buildings being built, and then you'll have a tour of the campus, okay? Very easy to sign up. You go to the admissions web, uh, admissions site, a calendar will pop up, you just pick a time that you can go. Uh, we, we consider this important enough that juniors are entitled to three excused absences to go visit schools and three excused absences as seniors as well to go visit schools. So, um, uh, you know, it really should be a priority. Uh, okay, I mentioned about the absences. Mrs. Sirocco in our attendance office can help you with that. It's a very common thing. A admissions office will give you, you know, like a postcard or a business card or something saying, you know, uh, that you were there. Um, again, the tours are usually given by students. You'll see dorms, you'll see cafeterias, you'll see um, classrooms. Um, and if you have special circumstances, you know, I think it's easy, particularly at this point in time, to, to kind of forget that colleges are looking for, for really great students like you guys. So, um, you know, if you have some special circumstances, um, uh, uh, you know, call admissions. They are very happy to sit down with you. Um, some schools do interviews. I think as the numbers get bigger, students applying to more schools. Um, uh, more and more schools are not doing it, but if it's something that's offered, uh, it can go a, a long way in helping you. Um, and, and we're happy to help you. We've got some uh, handouts and flyers about you know what like interview questions might be. Um, colleges also hold open houses, which is a great way to also get a lot of information. Personally, I don't think it's as individualized because it's it, it's you know it's. it's they could be massive and, and lots of people, but you know, a great way to get a lot of information. Um, I mentioned the tour and the information session. Um, you know, walk around, talk to students, sit and have lunch. Um, some schools will have a tour for parents and a tour for students. Um, and uh, uh, you know, and, and that's a great way to do it. But you know, you'll get a vibe. I really do think it's almost like a. Um, you know, like almost an instinctive kind of a thing. You walk on a campus and you're like, wow, I can really see myself here. Or the opposite, and, um, and that happens all the time as well. Okay, so there's basically four ways of applying to college. Um, there's, er, there's rolling, I'm gonna start from the bottom up. Um, early action, that is anywhere between say October 1 and December 1, I'm just making these dates up, okay? Early action is a win-win for students. You can apply to as many early action schools as you want to, and what it means is you will get an answer early. Um, in the last five years, the early action pool is really huge, so I encourage students to apply to that. What ha what's happening more and more is if they don't admit you in the early action pool, they're not gonna, uh, well, you could get um, denied, not likely, um, but you probably will get deferred and put into the regular action, um, the regular decision pool. So they're not saying yes, they're not saying no, um, they just want some more information, okay? And then that will be a couple months down the road. Early decision is the binding one, okay? If you have a school that you are absolutely positive it is the right school for you, this is a binding application, so you can only apply to one. Okay? The understanding is that 
um, you, you know, you're committed. Um, so uh, does it raise your chances of being admitted? I would say so, because colleges are going to take a certain percentage of their freshman class from the early decision pool because they know you're coming. Okay? They'll give you a ballpark figure in terms of financial aid, but you don't have the opportunity to sort of compare one financial aid package to another. Um, so, you know, early decision is, is a great way for some kids. I have a three or four students, probably more than I've ever had uh, in the past this year, um, apply early decision and, and they all got in. Um, regular decision can be anywhere from, as I said, November 1 to, uh, you know, February 15th or something like that. Today's January 15th, big deadline day um, for a lot of colleges, the SUNY system in particular. Um, but we always tell students, think about having your college applications finished off the dining room table and out the door by Thanksgiving, because it's just one of those things, there's nothing to be gained by waiting. Um, so a regular decision you could uh, apply in November and you would possibly get an answer January, February. Um, other than early decision, the, you have until the 1st of May to make a decision, okay? So you apply to 10 schools, you get into eight of them, you don't have to tell, uh, you know, which school you're going to attend till the 1st of May. And the reason for that is so you can get the financial aid packages and possibly revisit and, um, uh, and, and make a, you know, an informed decision. Um, the, th the fourth kind of uh, admission process is rolling, which means um, um, sort of the early bird gets the worm kind of thing. As soon as you have a complete application, which would be, you know, you filled out the application online, you've got letters of recommendation, you have sent your scores, you've done your essay, um, so your application is complete, okay? So as soon as that's complete, a, a college will um, review it and give you an answer. So I mean, there are some schools, especially if you do it really early on, um, uh, where you know you'll have you can have a decision in a couple of weeks. Um, we can't say this enough. Don't wait till the deadline. I would not like to tell you how many seniors I have in my office today that just realized that January 15 was the deadline for some of the schools that they hadn't gotten around to applying to. So, um, okay. So there's a couple of recommendations you're going to need. And again, you know we just touched on it briefly. Yes, you're. Um, your grades and your scores are important, but those are just two pieces of, uh, you know, an overall puzzle. Um, extracurriculars are important, jobs are important, sports are important, and that's your thing. Um, how you have behaved and, and um, you know, what your uh, teachers think of you, okay? Most colleges don't want more than one or two teacher letters of recommendation. Um, just purely because they can't read them all. Um, but I would recommend that you think about, you know, a teacher that knows you well. Does not have to be the class that's got the highest grade in, but somebody that has seen your work ethic and seen you. Sometimes a class you didn't do well in, uh, it, it, a teacher can write even a better letter because they see, you know, how much effort you put into it. Um, there's a method of doing it through Naviance, which obviously we'll show you. Um, and but you know, the first step would be to start thinking about like who, who knows me as a student. Teacher recommendation is very different than a counselor recommendation. Um, we're going to ask you and give you at the towards the end of the year a junior autobiography, and that's uh, you know a document just to be sure that we know everything that you've done. You may be involved in your church, your church, or a community service organization. Um, that you know, we want to be sure that we address. The counselor letter is more holistic. Um, we'll talk about the student as you know, as you know, involved in all the different things. Um, we can't, we don't, and we can't write a letter without an autobiography. So um, again, we really encourage you to do that. Uh, give it to us before the end of the school year, or at the very least, you know, in the beginning of, of this of the of senior year. Um, we'll go through the mechanics of transcript requests. Um, if you guys are applying to college, you're sitting home, you've got a Common App account, and you're applying to 10 schools. We'll talk about the Common App a little bit more later. Um, 
We have no way of knowing that you've applied. That's where Naviance comes in. That's another step. You have to go into Naviance and you have to request that Brewster High School send your transcripts out. That, you know, generates a list and I know, okay, great, I now have to, you know, put the package together and, and, and uh, send it out to the schools that you're interested in. Um, if you're applying as a, um, an artist or a musician or NCAA, please let us know that. Um, those are great attributes to be bringing to college, but it does require sort of another layer of the application process. So um, we're happy to talk about that. The art teachers are wonderful in terms of helping with that as well as the music teachers. Uh, okay, financial aid. As I said, the numbers are scary. Um, there's a form called the FAFSA form, and it's a federal form. Uh, just about two years ago, they changed the filing date to October. It used to be January, and then they realized it just made it so much more difficult for colleges to get that. So basically, your students are going to be going to college in 2020. Um, so you will need your income tax information from 2018. Okay? And it's a government form, you fill it out, and they identify a, um, uh, you know, what sort of financial aid you might be eligible for. Very often we have people say, well, I'm not going to fill it out, I don't think I'll qualify for any financial aid. If you don't fill the FAFSA out, it kind of closes the door for a lot of opportunities. So, um, you know, it's, it's not the easiest form in the world to fill out, but um, I would highly recommend everybody do it. We have a specialist that comes in from New York State to go over how to fill out the FAFSA, and that's right around that October date. Um, but it is the gateway to any sort of financial aid. The majority of money, yes, there's scholarships, there's wonderful local scholarships around here, but the majority of money, you know, the bulk of money, I should say, comes from the college themselves. And, you know, if they don't have your FAFSA information, you're not gonna, they're not going to be able to qualify your student for, for different programs. Um, there's also a second uh, financial aid form that you may be asked to fill out. It's called the CSS Profile. It tends to be used more by small, smaller private schools. Um, if, they, if they don't require it, we would recommend you don't fill it out because it asks you, you know, the value of the, your cars and your home and this and that and everything else. It can sometimes work you know, to your disadvantage rather than your advantage. If a college requires it, you have to do it. Um, and as I said before, don't eliminate a college based on the sticker price. Um, you know, uh, as I said, uh, private schools are in the 60s. They have a lot of money. Uh, the state schools, you know, they're, they're in you know, 25 to $30,000, but you're not going to get more than probably the ten or $15,000 scholarship from a state school just because they're state funded. So um, you really don't know what a college is going to cost till taken all these steps. Um, now, we're, we're talking to our seniors a lot about scholarships now. Um, there's a, a lot of resources on our website, um, and Google uh, different scholarships. Right around March, we have a whole um, number of scholarships that come out that are uh, local scholarships, the Lions Club, the uh, Brewster Education Foundation. Um, so. Uh, we have a lot of resources for that as well. There's also a website called Raise Me, something that we have uh, introduced and, and asked kids to, to, um, uh, to sign up for. Basically, if a college is a member of Raise Me, they will give you, they call them micro scholarships, um, and for the things that you're already doing, it's kind of like a no-brainer, but it's yet again another thing you have to fill out. So, um, you know, you're a varsity athlete, and a college may put a $500 value on that. You know, you got, you're taking two AP classes. A uh, school could put a $1,000, um, I'm just making these numbers up, uh, value on that. If you wind up going to that school, and you have signed up for this, and, and follow them, you have to kind of like follow the schools, um, you would get that money. So, um, you know, it's, it's relatively new, um, doesn't take a whole lot of time, you just do have to update it every now and again. Okay, so just to kind of put things in perspective, uh, you should be researching schools. Um, please come to all of the 
just a great turnout tonight, so thank you all for coming. This is wonderful. Um, we're happy to meet with uh, individually with students and parents. We know that's hard to do. We'll do our best to accommodate you. Figure out what kind of standardized testing. You know, if you lay it out and you think about it, then it doesn't feel, you know, you're not uh, registering the night before the deadline. Um, and you can visit when you can. Autobiography, as I said, at the end of the year, we'd like that back. Um, and uh, our website is really comprehensive. It's got calendars on it. It's got resources on it. It's got this presentation on it. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's in your best interest. There's a lot of information there um, that, that, that could be helpful. So just to kind of take the, ne the next step forward, um, for senior year, you know, we'll be finalizing lists. As I said, Thanksgiving is always a good target. Um, right after we get back to school, um, we will have a meeting and we'll go through, again, more of the mechanics, but we go over and over this with students um, in group guidance and through PowerPoints. Uh, late September is the financial aid meeting. October 1 is the date to fill out FAFSA. Um, we have application workshops where we clear our calendars, you know, period one to nine, and where somebody is available at any point in the day to sit down one on one and say, okay, let's pull up your common app and, you know, get 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 you through it. Um, most students will take an SAT in an, a an SAT or an ACT in the spring of junior year, and then they'll take it again in the fall of senior year. That's sort of the, the, the common. Uh, timeline of things. Um, score reports, once you're happy with your scores, um, that has to come directly from the testing agency's letters of recommendation, and Navion's transcripts we discussed, and then um, scholarships um, we'll talk about throughout the year. So, um, should we open it up for some questions? Yes, ma'am. When will we be starting the autobiographies, and are they starting them in school? Uh, it's a packet. They can come pick it up in the guidance office and, and there's a part for parents to fill out that we really appreciate because then we learn things about, you know, your students that we might not know. Um, and I think you can download it off the website as well and just print it out. So the last, um, the last group guidance session will give a hard copy. And again, just to reiterate, this is um, a pretty decent packet to ask a number of questions. And we'll sort of tell students, like, answer the prompts that speak to you. You know, what we're trying to extract from that is that holistic picture, who they are, and you're, you're the expert. So when that parent piece on the back doesn't have to be some elaborate um, essay, but a lot of the times, you know, what's in their name, some of the struggles they've had, some of the ways that you describe them are very inspirational to how we write our letter and, and kind of put them forward. So it's not a list, like, you know, we're not, listing on our letters, <clears throat> Johnny has an 85. They can find that. Um, Johnny's in these 12, 12 clubs. We want to kind of summarize the teacher feedback, your feedback and sentiment, um, their passion, maybe use some of their quotes to really give a holistic character piece to their um, letter. So the more that's in there, the more we have to draw from and, and the more individualized that letter is, especially coming across to the admissions panel who are reviewing probably over 200 in a day. Your student can invite you. I think they just add your email or you can send us an email and we'll, we'll work with you to get you in there. Um, I, I'm not sure if the, if the parents use the same code as the student, but contact us or ask the student to invite you um, or send us an email and then you can have access to the platform and see what we're doing um, in the different sessions and sometimes there's just supplemental information in there that you might find helpful as well. And everything that we've covered in group guidance is there. It's not like it goes away. So, you know, you pull, you pull it up and we're like, okay, we're talking about DSATs. You know, what you didn't do something back in October, you can go back and look at that. So. Go 
So um, we, we registered some for Remind Me. So some of your students kind of put in the code and can put in the code um, that'll send them that tax reminder. Emails go through Naviance and, and in the um, morning announcements that are now um, an email format or some sort of document they pull up in their email. So they will, throughout, let's say the, the six junior sessions we do this year, your son or daughter won't miss the same class period. Um, the groups will run, because there's five of us counselors this year, will run five periods a day for at least the four days of the week, and then make up days usually on Friday. So um, it changes, but you, the students know ahead of time. It'll either say, here's your time and date, or there's um, a, a TV screen right outside guidance and also like a big easel that will have their name and when they can come. So they're sort of reminded throughout the week to come check by and then they're announced. So the period in between the four minute um, or three minute passing time, your son or daughter's name will be announced and then we also take attendance for them. So it's not like the teachers are like, where's, you know, Sarah today? It's in there, they'll see group guidance excused and then again, Students have to be proactive and an advocate for themselves to say, like, Sarah should not skip AP Calc and should go with Mrs. Jones for her, her study hall or her lunch, and kids can bring lunch. So it's, it's flexible. They just have to sort of keep, a, keep an eye on it, and, and, you know, we can welcome you in the Google Classroom. You can see the Remind Me app, so if that helps you remind the reminder, <laughs> the more attend, the better attendance we have, the better it is for everybody. Any questions? Should she take the SAT in the spring of this year and then take it again next year? How does that? That's sort of the normal trajectory. Okay. I mean, if you, if, if your student takes the SAT in um, May or June and their score is awesome, then they can go with that score. Um, you know, so many of the classes that the, some of the information is on, they're still taking. So you want to kind of get to the end of the school year. Um, you know, some people take them three or four times, and some people take them once. You know, it really all depends on. One thing I would recommend is if you are taking AP classes, I would not take the May SAT because they're all within like a few days of one another, and that's a lot of tests. So you know, the first week or two of May are APs, AP exams. So June would be that. Yeah, and you just have to keep things into perspective. You know, sports. So let's say June, and some kids are athletes. Sometimes sectionals are right around that time, or an upperclassman's prom. So you know, you kind of want to look at the calendar and then work backwards. What type of prep work am I doing? How much effort? You know, some students think like, oh, just retake it again. I'll do better. You, know, you won't really do better without putting the time and effort into things. And I know that sounds obvious to most of us, but we all have some teenagers in here that might not believe in that uh, work ethic. So the preparation is key. So I think like if you can talk about it in the next week or so and register and get on the calendar and know you're taking it here, that takes a little bit of the stress out of it and then work backwards. Okay, what's your plan? Um, you know, Sean, what are you gonna do? How, how much time are you gonna um, spend on some of the online sites. There's also, as we mentioned, a list of resources on our website, whether they're classes here, Princeton Review classes at some tutoring centers, individual, um, <clears throat> individual tutoring. But traditionally, students will take it in the spring, and then if they're not happy with that score, take it again. But it's, you've got to know when to quit while you're ahead. You know, again, this is one-fifth of this pie um, and you don't want to stress yourself out. There's other pieces that you can focus on instead of just kind of re-traumatizing yourself sitting in the SAT, so be conscious about that. And just seek support when you need it. You know, sometimes students just need to come in and hear from us, like, you know what, if you put in your best effort, it's a decent score, you gotta move on, or let's strategize and look at some of the test optional schools, or in our letters, we can talk about that too. You know, there's some students that, their SAT scores will not match their um, work ethic and, and how they perform in the classroom. And we can speak to a little bit, maybe, background of why, or at least our feedback. So, you know, please use us as a resource if you find yourself in the um, hamster wheel of, of SAT or ACT testing. Yes? Yeah. 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 
So the game plan is for the juniors to fill out. There's a link on the Google Classroom that just gives us, yes, it's just for the students to fill out, giving us some criteria, maybe what major they might be interested in, what type of plan they have for after high school, um, feedback for if they visited any schools, so um, that they can, they can fill out, which just helps advise our individual meeting. I think it also helps students struggle to think about you know, what do I want, and that was the same before. You know, a school that's got 2,000 kids is a very different place than a school that has 20,000 kids. So, you know, it sounds very simple, but, you know, at this point in time, I think just narrowing that down a little bit can take a little bit of stress off. Yeah. Well, some of this, too, we can kind of say the same day. At the same time? send us an email we'll look into it for you I'm not sure all the okay okay so in some cases there's stipulations that they'd have to look at and um, you know, I'm sorry someone to get back to you, but maybe just to bring, bring it back to their attention and call just because, um, yeah, that is something to figure out. And then there's stipulations from the testing agencies as far as flexibility. So we should get an answer sooner than later. There's a gentleman in the back. Is there any benefit to doing the school's application versus having to actually go through the application? That is a good question. So for the most part, they will tell us no. Um, you know that they're reviewing all the applications with with the with the with the same lens. Um, they tend to be asked about the same questions. Um, you know, sometimes there is a benefit if a school gives you like a fast app or some of these priority apps that sort of condense the information. Um, but what we would probably tell you, and again, Mrs. Jones can add in some different information is. Um, the Common App, if, if we can kind of streamline it and that school's on Common App, stick with it. You know, your student's filling out the one, like maybe one time, all the same information, the background, the education, the classes that they're in, um, and, and getting it in a one-stop shop where then they're just clicking buttons to submit payment, maybe add some supplemental essays. But from what we've been hearing, and I'm sure they said that the college <coughs> that they, they review them all the same. Yeah, there, there really isn't any difference. And you know, we've mentioned the Common App a number of times, but we haven't really explained it. So the Common App is a website that has somewhere between you know, six and 800 colleges that are members of it, okay? Particularly a lot of schools on the East Coast. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty lengthy uh, application you have to fill out, and it asks you, you know, everything from you know, what your parents do for a living to what did you get in eighth grade on your living environment say, uh, class? Um, but you know, it, again, if you follow it systematically, you've got all the information. The autobiography also is kind of a compilation of that same information. So even though know, kids don't really like to sit down and do that, it can help you say, oh wow, yeah, I did do that back in ninth grade or tenth grade. <coughs> so after you've got this whole application filled out, um, and let's say you're applying to 10 schools. All 10 of those schools uh, are members of the Common App and more and more are becoming. Uh, but then you basically hit send and your college application is gone to those 10 schools. There's a few aberrations in there, but you know, just you know, keep using the term what we haven't really described. It. So like the SUNY schools, you can apply uh, using a SUNY application, you can apply, um, uh, you know, paper forms in, for some schools, or you can do, do it through the common app. And as Kate was saying, if your schools are all common apps, keep it simple. Stay with you know one um, you know one vehicle that you're using to apply. Okay? If you don't have that option, then you're gonna have to fill out what you have to fill out. Well colleges really do not differentiate between how you apply. It's the same information, it's just basically how it's delivered. And so that's why the last session we'll have with your it will be to get them on that, at least get them familiar with anything they can pre-fill out, 
and then we continue to have workshops for the Common App, but any application in, in the fall. And I, and, I, and I know this might sound obvious, but we have to allow the students to sort of drive and take the initiative there. It's one of the biggest steps. Um, I've seen some common mistakes where parents will email me and how do I fill out this? And I'm sort of like, well, send John in and we can help them. But you, know, you want to just get them familiar with advocating for themselves. Even as simple, it's not us being lazy, but them sort of taking the initiative of asking a question or communicating with us via email because they might have questions for admissions counselors. And um, you know, using their own email. So I can't say that enough. You know, if, if Sarah's application has you know, best dad ever at AOL.com, it looks a little funny and, and it happens um, more often than we think. So just sort of reminding them that there is support, so you don't have to stay at home, you know, every week and be like Wednesdays. We're sitting down together to do this. You know, they will um, right off the bat in the in the first month. I've already had you know one opportunity, if not two or three, to sit down with us. They could sign up for more than one application workshop. So just keep reminding them the resources are there. Um, you could always check in with us to make sure that they are availing themselves of it. But you know, please encourage them to sort of take this first step in independence and filling this information out and, and finding it. It will allow them to start sort of breaking ties and make us all feel a little bit more comfortable when they're leaving us the, the following fall to, to go into the college and advocate on their own behalf. I just want to mention one other thing about the application process. Um, I know high school students don't use Facebook as much as some of the rest of us do. Um, but colleges do have access to social media, okay? So, um, you know, just be careful what you put out there and what pictures you put out there and what statements you put out there because it can and, and is looked at by colleges. I don't know how they do it, but they do. Uh, the question was, um, students that are thinking of possibly going, going to college abroad or are out of the country. Um, we have some resources. Um, I mean, Naviance has got schools all over the world. Um, but that would be a good, you know, sort of a good conversation to be having sooner rather than later. So we, we don't have that many kids that do that. Um, so we might have to do a little bit of research on our own. But, um, you know, certainly there's lots of, lots of resources out there. So the PSAT scores are in Naviance already. Those kids who have already taken the SAT, when will those scores be added in there to look at that for the colleges as well? So the SAT scores will be updated as we get them, but if your son or daughter just took them and you know you have scores, you could absolutely um, email the counselor and we can sort of manually input it until the sort of computer operations person uploads that information if they get it. So that will help, as you mentioned, kind of target things yeah, a little bit better. There's also a drop down when you're in those scattergrams um, that sometimes you have to move away from the PSAT score to do the drop down for the SAT. So you might want to just check there first. But then you could always email us and we can manually input it that day and then you'll be up to speed if, if that's the case. Because sometimes it does take a while for them to import all the scores from the different um, test dates. It's usually about a month to five weeks. Yeah, because it was the December one, so right. maybe by the end of the month then. Yes, probably. Yeah, or just email us. And if you have the score and the sort of the breakdown, um, it just makes it easier. Um, we'll just get it in there. Any other questions? Thank you so much. This is a we appreciate you coming out.